switched on the TV today There was no surprise to the same old thing There was war and crime and sex and drugs And greed like I've never seen The more I watched, the more I got mad As the talking heads kept babbling on But then a man came on who spoke so nice Said he's gonna make this world a better place He's gonna give us peace, give us our money Be our friend and give us some peace of mind, yeah this song and dance the man tells me how it's gonna be he's gonna give us this and give us that and help us all to fulfill our dreams he's gonna make us great once again and lead us all to a better day yeah I don't believe a word he's saying can save our land he's the one who can heal our wounds he's the only one that we can trust and vote for Jesus yeah vote for Jesus yeah 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 I vote for Jesus I vote for Jesus yeah 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 I vote for Jesus I vote for Jesus All right, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, good evening everyone. Could you turn your Bibles to Daniel chapter 11, verse 40. Daniel chapter 11, verse 40. Uh, we're going to, um, we're going to uh, begin a study of verses 40 through 45 of Daniel chapter 11, which obviously closed the chapter if you look at your Bibles. And uh, it's, these verses are about the Armageddon campaign. It's basically uh, talking about the period uh, of the 70th week, which begins with the Antichrist. Uh, desecrating the temple uh, by deifying himself and sitting, uh, uh, sitting on the mercy seat between the wings of the cherubim and then uh, building a, an image of himself to have the world worship. And then uh, that ends with the second advent of Christ. It lasts for three and a half years. It's called the end uh, in, this pro in these verses. Uh, it's, uh, it's talking about a period. It's called the times, time and a half time. In Daniel chapter 12, 
uh, verse uh, 7. Uh, it's it's, it's talk, uh, spoken about in Revelation 11, 2. It's uh, found in Revelation 12. It's the last three and a half years of the 70th week. And uh, if, if, of course, if you look at that uh, chart I, I made, I created, uh, the black and white one, it ba and I got an, another one I'm, I'm working on, and which I'll have maybe uh, this week. Uh, the, Daniel, the, the 70 weeks um, chart that I have here, if you notice, it's broken out into two, three and a half year periods. So the, pro the verses here, the prophecies contained in verses 40 through 45 of Daniel chapter 11 are related to that final three and a half year period. And it's called the Armageddon campaign because Armageddon is basically, a lot of people don't understand this, but it says this in Revelation, it's a campaign. It actually is a war to end all wars. It's a three and a half year war. Uh, I don't know how, how long was World War II for America. That we were in it from 1941 to 1946. So it was about four years, a little over there. Well, this war is going to be shorter than that, but uh, there'll be nothing like it on the face of the earth. Plus, you get the wrath of God being poured out upon the world at that time, and Satan will be uh, f from the last three and a half years of the uh, the seventieth week. Anti uh, not only was Antichrist on the earth and the false prophet, but you got Satan himself has been cast to the earth. Remember, by Michael and the elect angels, the fallen angels are, are thrown out of heaven and they're now on planet earth. So you have the Satan in his wrath and God in his wrath. You don't want to be living during this period. So all, verses 40 through 45 are all about this period. And in fact, it's particular, the military, the, the movements of, uh, of the Antichrist and the armies of the earth. Uh, there's, mention, there's a reference to the armies of the east that are mentioned in Revelation 16. When we get to that verse, I think it's verse 45, we'll talk about that in Revelation 16, which is going to undoubtedly be China and the armies of the Far East. So we got a, uh, and it's also, it's interesting, the, the, you hear the nation Syria that's in the news today. Uh, well, Syria and her allies are going to be, are the, as we'll see this evening, in verses 40 through 45, they're the king of the north. Uh, in the, uh, in, so this is quite interesting. You see Syria in the news with Israel. Uh, this is going to continue forward. You've heard Egypt. Uh, Egypt's going to be a, 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 big, a big player in the, in the tribulation period. Of course, they get defeated by Antichrist. Of course, Israel is occupied for that three and a half year period by the Antichrist. So uh, it's going to be a, a quite an a, a, a amazing period of history to talk, and it's uh, the war to end all wars. So we're going to talk a lot about the military movements of the king of the uh, the north and the uh, a lot of movements of the antichrist in this passage i'm very i'm, I'm looking forward to explain it's not, i don't think it's tonight but in the, in the coming evenings this week this week and next week I've, i'm going to talk about a lot of um uh, so, uh, some interesting things here about uh, the, the, uh, uh, in verses 40 through 45 about the Antichrist that I don't think anybody has brought out that I've read. And I think uh, when I, I'll show you when it, when it takes, uh, when we get to it, but uh, about the Antichrist and what's going to prompt him to go into, you know, to, to, to do his attack. And actually what's interesting, uh, verses 40, verse 40 when it talks about the king of the north and the king of the south, their attack is upon the Antichrist in response to him deifying himself and demanding that the world worship him. A lot of conservative Bible teachers, that, you know, uh, great Bible teachers uh, that I've listened to, like Dr. Pentecost and John Wolverd, uh, they, uh, they have a, diff a little bit different scenario, and I believed it for a long time, but after studying this passage, um, I believe that uh, Antichrist is going to go in, uh, is already, when it, verses 40 through 45, he's already in the, pro in, the, uh, in the land of Israel at that time because of his agreement with the leadership of Israel, the treaty. So uh, a lot of them think that the invasion, uh, Antichrist moves in because of the, the attack from the king of the north and the king of the south. They, and um, we'll talk about that. I don't want to get ahead of myself here, too far ahead of myself and confuse you. But we'll, we've got a lot of cool things. This, this is a great section of the chapter. It's all future. So, uh, and then after that, we only have the 13 verses of chapter 12, which has a lot of, quite a lot of interesting things in it as well. So, um, well, now let's get, for, uh, let's get underway here. Let's take that moment of silent prayer as we normally do. We uh, take this moment of silent prayer to examine ourselves, to determine and see if we're in fellowship with God. Uh, remember, we can't have fellowship with God if we're harboring any sin in our lives. Uh, to think that God would have fellowship with us is an insult of God and a misunderstanding of the holiness of God. Just because we're saved by the grace of God and we're in union with Christ and indwelt by the Trinity, uh, that doesn't mean he's having fellowship with us when we're living in sin. Meaning, Living in sin meaning uh, we're thinking sinful thoughts and we're performing sinful thoughts and 
God's not going to have anything to do with us. You're still his child, but he doesn't have fellowship with you. Just like you parents, uh, you would not have fellowship with your kid if the kid is living in disobedience, right? It's kind of funny, but, and sad too, more sad than funny, but I say it funny in a, in a, in a figurative sense, that you know, a lot of people don't understand discipline in our country because their parents don't discipline them. Uh, so they don't understand the discipline of God. Why we, you know, in our day and age, you know, we think of discipline, and we think of it in a negative sense always. They, they, the discipline of God is always for a positive reason, so that we could share His holiness. So, you know, God, even though we're indwelt by the Trinity and we're we're in union with Christ and with the forgiveness of our sins, and we're going to go to heaven when we die, and we're going to get a resurrection body. And well, He's not having fellowship with you if we're if we're lit out of fellowship, if we're lit, thinking sinful thoughts and we're performing sinful actions and speaking sinfully. He ain't going to have anything to do with us. So, be careful. Uh, about the, you know, there's the teaching out there, if you heard me say, they say that you don't have to confess your sins, and it's, it's get proliferating, it's, get, it's moving around, it, it appeals to the sin nature, quite frankly, no wonder it's becoming very popular, but it's not biblical, and uh, of course, I will challenge any, any, any pastor on the face of this planet who wants to talk about this, uh, this whole thing, to whether we have to confess our sins or not as believers, I will gladly uh, take the person on in front of um, as many people as you want to have, just so I can reach a lot of people and show that these people who are teaching false doctrine need to be exposed for what they are, and that's wolves in sheep's clothing. And uh, I'm, you could tell them I said that, you know who I'm talking about. This is a bad thing that's going on in the church today, and I'm going to protect the flock of God, and I'm going to protect all of you that listen on Pow Talk and our web, hit our website. It's a serious problem that's hitting the church today. And, 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 and of course, if we don't uh, confess our sins, we're out of fellowship with God, and then we're going to be under discipline from God, and, it's, uh, it's, uh, and some people are going to die the sinner to death because of it. And uh, we don't want to see that happen, of course. That's why I make a, a, a strident a, a attack against these people teaching this false doctrine, because I care about the body of Christ. I, in fact, I care about them, some of, uh, some of whom I was, have been friends with in the past, and unfortunately, I am no longer uh, having fr uh, a fellowship with them. So uh, it's a very important uh, subject uh, time right now where we examine ourselves. A lot of people who used to sit night after night and listen to the same thing I'm telling you now, and now they don't think you don't have to confess your sins. So you have to understand why you have to confess your sins. That's why I take a moment to explain it and, uh, and so that you know why you have to confess your sin and have that conviction because it's taught in the Scripture. That's where we get our conviction. So uh, with that in mind, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you so much for this day. And we often take for granted these days that you've given to us. You haven't promised in Scripture the years to us. You promised to us days. Help us to live as good stewards with the time, that, the precious time that you've given to us. Uh, impress upon your people uh, the importance of making the most of their time on earth not living in sexual immorality or legalism or self-righteousness or living in disobedience to the scriptures in general. Uh, help them to realize that the most important thing that they have in life is the word of God. And we just pray, Father, that you'd help your people to put their priori keep their priorities straight if they already are. And if they're not, uh, discipline them and convict them that they need to set their priorities straight and putting the word of God first in their lives. Because with the word of God and obedience to it is obedience to your will and there's true joy and happiness and spiritual growth and the glorification of you and your son, Jesus Christ. 
And by staying in fellowship with you through obedience to your word, we, st- we tear down strongholds that Satan has put up that are all around us. This world is deceived by the devil and his minions. And so help us to stand as lights in the darkness of this Satan's cosmic system by obeying your word. Help us not to be self involved in self-deception and only choosing those scriptures that we that we like and, and dis- disregarding the ones we don't like. Help us to be objective and be humble and look at ourselves in light of the scriptures. None of us is perfect. We're all sinners saved by the grace of God. So help us to see ourselves in light of what your word says so that we might bring glory to you, so that we might know the truth. So Father, we just thank you for this study that we're going to uh, engage in on in the book of Daniel about the future activities of the Antichrist during the Armageddon campaign. Uh, we thank you for your people that are here this evening. We pray that you would help all those in the audience, whether they're on Pal Talk or face-to-face here in the Thompson home or on, on the website. Show them, uh, help them and under, to understand what is being taught, to remain objective, to concentrate, uh, help them to make application of the things that they're learning. We also pray, Father, that you would give grace to myself as the communicator Uh, Help me to speak only that which you want me to say and nothing more and nothing less. Uh, Help me to be uh, concentrating as well upon what the Spirit is saying in the Scriptures and help me communicate, interpret accurately and communicate accurately your word so that your people are built up and edified spiritually and you and your Son, Jesus Christ, are glorified. We thank you for Titus Thompson and Jody Thompson and their hospitality to us and opening up their home to us. We thank you for the technology that you've given to us, and we thank you for Titus's work with it. We pray that you give him wisdom in this area, and again, we thank you for his service. Father, we just pray that as a result of this Bible class, that with one voice, we uh, praise you and your son, and we draw closer to you in light of the imminency of the events that we're going to study here this evening in the book of Daniel. In our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. This evening, as uh, promised that before the prayer meeting, uh, the opening prayer, I should say, uh, we're going to be uh, noting uh, verses 40 through 45, or begin to note this evening. And the first prophecy that we're going to note in verse 40 is the prophecy of Egypt and Syria attacking Antichrist during the last three and a half years of the 70th week. And, uh, of course, Egypt and Syria have been in, uh, in current events, so they're going to be a big player uh, in the uh, in the end times. Also, we're going to be talking about Russia tonight. Uh, they're not in this prophecy, and I'm going to mention them uh, in light of that fact that they're not mentioned this prophecy because uh, many many men that I highly admire and learned a lot from. Uh, they believe that uh, the king of the north here is actually Russia. And I'm going to show you that is, in fact, not the case. And that's not supported her- uh, the, hermeneutically. It's uh, inconsistent, as I'm going to put out, meaning it's not inconsistent in the interpretation of this chapter to make the king of the north here Russia. And I'm going to show you not just from the text there that it's not Russia, but also from a comparison of Ezekiel 38, which mentions uh, the Russian-led invasion that will take place, which I believe, uh, from what the scriptures show me, uh, is somewhere in the midway point of the, the, se- the 70th week. Some, like Tim LaHaye and Tommy Eisen, um, they say that it's probably going to be before the, the 70th week or at the beginning. And so uh, I, I'm, I'm not in agreement with, on that, with him in that. I don't think it's a serious issue in interpreting it. It's, uh, it's pretty much debated where that, the timing of that invasion. But uh, nonetheless, what I'm going to show you is the king of the north in chapter 11 in verses 40 through 45 is, is, is in fact not Russia. And there's uh, reasons that we're going to show you in the scripture that's the case. Now, what I want to do is we're going to, our subject is verse 40, the first prophetic statement there. But I, what I want to do is I want to read uh, not only from the New American Standard, uh, but uh, also my translation and the Net Bible's translation of uh, Daniel chapter 11, verses 40 through 45, which I told you before is about the Armageddon campaign uh, with the Antichrist activities against the Jews, the Jewish people during the last three and a half um, years of the 70th week. So if you could uh, look at Daniel chapter 11, verse 40, and I'm going to read all the way through verse 45 from the New American Standard. Then I'm going to read those verses from the Net Bible, uh, which eventually I'll probably go over to in in the future. And then uh, also uh, my translation of those verses. So Daniel 11.40 says, 
in the New American Standard, at the end time, the king of the south will collide with him, and the king of the north will storm against him with chariots, with horsemen, and with many ships, and he will enter countries, overflow them, and pass through. He will also enter the beautiful land, as we'll see, that's Israel, and many countries will fall, but these will be rescued out of his hand, Edom, Moab, the foremost sons of Ammon, now, uh, Amnon, excuse me, and uh, those, as we'll see, those last three are now what we call the, pro the modern day, the kingdom of Jordan. We'll see that in the future. Then he will stretch out his hand against other countries, and the land of Egypt will not escape. But he will gain control over the hidden treasures of gold and silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt. That's going to be interesting, because we look at today as Egypt as a, a, a country that's impoverished, and of course they are, but they're actually sitting on great wealth. And we know that from the archaeological digs, uh, in digging up the, uh, the remains of the, uh, of the pharaohs, and there's tons and tons of gold over there. So it's going to be interesting. What, one of the things I'm going to bring out is the Antichrist is going to prop up his economy with the gold he finds out of here too, I believe. That's what I think is going to happen as well. So he says he'll gain control over the hidden treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt, and Libyans and Ethiopians will follow at his heels. But rumors from the east, and as we'll say, let's compare that with Revelation 16. It's talking about the armies out of China and you know, Japan, North Korea. That's what that's referring to, as we'll see. And from the north, rumors from the east, East and the north will disturb him, the north being Syria, as we'll say. And he will go forth with great wrath to destroy and annihilate many. He will pitch the tents of his royal pavilion between the seas and the beautiful holy mountain, yet he will come to his end, and no one will help him. And of course, he'll come to his end, as we compare other scriptures like Revelation 19, he'll come to his end with the second advent of Jesus Christ. He will be destroyed by our Lord. Now, if you look at Daniel chapter 11, Verse 40, and I'm reading now from the Net Bible, which, by the way, I highly recommend everyone to get this Bible, and I'll tell you why. For many reasons, great translation, and the other thing is, it's got great notes, which are great for lay people, like yourselves, the church, and also if you're an ac uh, academic person, it's very, they're very good notes as well, great maps as well. So Daniel 11.40 says, at the, end, at the time of the end, the king of the south will attack him. Then the king of the north will storm against him with chariots, horsemen, and a large armada of ships. He will invade lands, passing through them like an overflowing river. Then he will enter the beautiful land. Many will fall, but these will escape, Edom, Moab, and the Amnite uh, leadership. He will extend his power against other lands. The land of Egypt will not escape. He will have control over the hidden stores of gold and silver, as well as all the treasures of Egypt. Libya and Libyans and Ethiopians will submit to him. But reports will trouble him from the east and north, and he will set out in tremendous rage to destroy and wipe out many. He will pitch his royal tents between the seas towards the beautiful holy land, mountain, and, but he will come to his end with no one to help him. Now, if I may, as promised, let's read from my translation of those same verses. Verses 40 through 45. Now, during the end time, the king ruling the south will cause himself to go to war against him. Also, the king ruling the north will cause himself to storm against him with a military chariot group, with a cavalry, as well as a large armada of ships. However, despite this, he will wage attacks against countries so that he will overflow, yes, pass through like a flood. He will even wage an attack against the beautiful land. Indeed, many will be defeated. However, these will, for their own benefit, escape from his power. Edom, as well as Moab, and in addition, the leadership of the citizens of Ammon. Yes, he will exercise his power against countries with the Egyptian people by no means being able to escape. He will even be in control over hidden treasures, namely their gold as well as their silver, indeed over all Egypt's valuable commodities. Also the Libyans, as well as the Cushites, will be under his control. However, reports from the east as well as the north will alarm him. Consequently, he will march out in a great rage in order to kill, yes, annihilate many. He will even pitch his royal tents between the seas, the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean, on the beautiful holy mountain. However, despite this, he will come to his end with absolutely no one to help him. So after providing Daniel with an extensive description of a king in verses 36 through 39, who will be an absolute world ruler and oppose God and deify himself, 
the angel, who we don't know his name here, informs Daniel that during the end, during the end time, the king ruling the south will go to war against this king that's described in verses 36 through 39. Also, he tells in verse 40, he tells Daniel that the king ruling the north will attack him as well as during the end time with a military chariot group, as well as a large armada of ships. Now, this prophecy will take place, we know from this passage, during the last three and a half years of the 70th week, and it reveals, <clears throat> excuse me, that both Egypt and Syria will attack the Antichrist during the last three and a half years of the 70th week. How do we know that? Because the phrase, the end time. The end time refers to the last three and a half years of the 70th week since the Antichrist will be a world ruler at this time from the final stage of the Roman Empire according to a comparison of Daniel 7, 23 through 25 and Daniel 9, 26 and 27, 2 Thessalonians 2 and Revelation 13. So this last, uh, last three and a half years of the 70th week is, in, is called, and in, in it's described, it's, uh, it's indicated by the phrase in Daniel 7.25 and Daniel 12.7, a times, time, and a half time. A time being a year, according to the Jewish calendar, 360 days. And times being two years, which would be 720 days. And a half time is 180 days, according to the Jewish calendar, equaling 42 months, or we could say uh, three and a half years, so 1,260 days. So this is in the book of Revelation, this final, uh, this final three and a half years, as indicated by those expression, uh, t phrases I mentioned before. So it's a very important, uh, it's mentioned a lot because it's important to the plan of God. Why? Because this final three and a half years of the 70th week will bring about the end of the times of the Gentiles, and will, which will usher in the millennial kingdom with Jesus Christ ruling bodily on the earth for a thousand years. And Satan imprisoned for a thousand years during that time. And all unbelievers are removed from the face of the earth. Both Jew and Gentile, they're removed from the face of the earth by the elect angels. And they're thrown into torments. And then at the end of history, they go to the lake of fire after visiting briefly the, the great white throne judgment which Jesus Christ will conduct at the end of human history. So there's a, a, several interpretive issues here in Daniel 11.40. If you look at verse 40 in the New American Standard, it says, at the end time, the king of the south will collide with him, and the king of the north will storm against him with chariots, with horsemen, and with many ships. So who is the him? <laughs> the, that word him there has uh, caused a lot of uh, debate, and it really is, I think, in my, in my opinion, very ridiculous, and just a lot of smart guys trying to be clever and, and uh, rather than just listening to the common sense of what the text is saying, following the flow of the argument from the angel, the way he's, he's presenting this, there's really no problem at all. Uh, it's uh, the hymn there, the two hymns, the hymns that meant the, the king of the south will collide with him. That's the Antichrist, the hymn. And king of the north will storm against him, the Antichrist. So there are people who disagree with that. So I want to as, I, as promised, I'd like to do this, uh, bring up interpretive issues, not too complicated, but important enough where you might run into this. And even if you don't, it's important that you do know these things and the people who dissent from our interpretation and why I feel that they're wrong. And this is and, and the, the interpretation I present to you is right. This is the way we should be doing Bible classes. You're going to remember something. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's, there's nothing wrong uh, when it comes to the interpretive issues in the Bible, it's, uh, there's nothing wrong. We have, there's a lot of passages in the Bible where there's no consensus amongst Bible scholars or Bible teachers on a lot of passages in the Bible. So it's very important. It's always good to see, okay, what's this person's interpretation? And why is it right or why is it wrong? So what I do is I like to bring out why my interpretation is right and why this is wrong. And you should, and, and you have to come to a conclusion if you think I'm right on that or I'm wrong. So a lot of times what I see, and, uh, and this, I, I, this happens in major religions, unfortunately, it's actually happening in evangelical Christianity today, uh, uh, fundamentalist Christianity, whatever you want to call it. They're, whatever the guy says at the pulpit, it, you know, I'm just going to accept it, and that's laziness. Uh, there's nothing wrong with um, the... the uh, uh, un, uh, asking questions, okay, why is that the case? And why is this this way? There's nothing wrong with that. I do that all the time as well. 
But we got to be careful that, you know, some people, if Dr. So-and-so or Pastor So-and-so says this, yet he gives no support for his interpretation, why are we, why are we believing that? I mean, I've heard some people say to me, just tell me, Bill, literally said this, just tell me, we believe whatever you say. It's like, that's laziness. I'm not the Pope. That's what Catholics do. They just, whatever Rome says, I believe, a lot of, not all of them, but whatever Rome says, I'm just buying it. I don't want you to be that way. I want you to think about these things. I want you to ask questions about these things. And there's, you know, we run into a couple of these things in Daniel, and uh, I think it's fun to do. But also, you know, you got to remember too when you, you know, when you're talking to a pastor, you know, you don't want to be in a, you know, you don't want to sit there and be uh, flip and be an arrogant, you know, like a teenager, you know, and uh, you know, trying to be a show off or trying to, you know, trying to stump the guy. You know, some people are into the stump in the past thing. That's wrong too. We, you you should be uh, asking questions because you want to know the truth, not because you want to, you know, get a big uh, high out of stumping the pastor. You know, that's just, that's, that's, that's foolishness and immature. We want to ask questions because we want to know the truth. We sincerely want to know the truth. So I bring out these interpretive issues from time to time when I think they're very important and uh, in understanding the passage. Some are not. But these are, I think, are important because we're talking about people, uh, good scholars, very good men of God, very uh, devout men of God, who don't agree with the fact that the hymn here in verse 40 is... Uh, the Antichrist. Some think it's Russia, and, and some think there's, uh, there's other people here. So what is it? Well, so the, uh, there's not just that interp- uh, there's not just that problem. There's another problem here too. Who's the king of the north? Is that Syria, like I say, or is it Russia? Because the great men of God, like Wolverine and Pentecost, they think it's Russia. And I'm going to show you. I don't believe that's Russia. I don't think it is at all. I think it's Syria. And Again, I'm going to show you my reasons, reasonings why, and also give their arguments as well. So the first problem is the identity of the, uh, the, the pronominal suffix, the third person, masculine, singular, pronominal suffix, who translated him in verse 40. Is it, and this, the other pro- interpretive problem in verse 40 is the identity of the king ruling the north. And this is going to, I, I, understanding the identity of the king of the north well, it's going to take us into Ezekiel 38 this evening. Now, some say that the, I, the, the hymn here is a reference to Antichrist, like I do, while some argue that it is Russia, while others contend that it's a reference to Syria. So again, some people think at the, end, at the, at the time of the end, the king of the south will collide with him, and the king of the north will storm against him with chariots. Note the emphasis on him. Some say that him, like me, say it's the Antichrist. And Pel- what Pentecost and Wolver would think the same way, guys like that. And then others say it's Russia, while others contend it's Syria. Now, most conservative scholars identify this word him in verse 40 as the king described in verses 36 through 39. So that's, the, that's in context what we've just been talking about. Therefore, in Daniel 11:40 we would have three subjects, namely the king ruling the south, the king ruling the north, and the king described in verses 36 through 39, who we found out is the Antichrist, not Antiochus Epiphanes IV, and we gave our reasonings for that. Consequently, we would have both the king ruling the south and the king ruling the north attacking the Antichrist during the last three and a half years of the 70th week. Now, some argue for only two subjects here in this verse, which is possible grammatically, however unlikely. The two subjects, they say, would be the king ruling the south and the king ruling the north, which would indicate that during the the last three and a half years of the 70th week, the king ruling the south would engage in war with the king ruling the the north. So basically, they're attacking each other. That's what some say. Now, those who adhere to this view contend that the king ruling the north is the Antichrist. Many who hold to this interpretation argue that the king of the north is a reference to Russia. Now, the problem with that is, is that in Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 9 verse 26, they make clear that the Antichrist will be the final ruler of the final stage of the Roman Empire during the 70th week. Remember, he's the little horn in chapter 7 that emerges out from the ten horns that are on the fourth beast and the ten horns... Uh, represent the final stage of the Roman Empire, and the fourth beast is the Roman Empire. The ten horns, representing the final stage of the Roman Empire, that'll appear during the 70th week, are on the fourth beast. 
So we, that's why we call it the final stage of the Roman Empire. Or some call it the revived form of the Roman Empire. So, therefore, he couldn't possibly uh, be... No uh, the king of the North here couldn't possibly uh, be Russia. It couldn't possibly be Russia. And so, therefore, throughout chapter 11, the king of the North is consistently identified with the Seleucid Empire, and the Antichrist is always connected with the Roman Empire throughout the book of Daniel. So in the context of the book of Daniel, we see that the king of the north is, the, is, is, the, is Syria. The Seleucid Empire was north of Israel in Syria, what we don't know, now know it today is Syria. So he's, uh, the Antichrist is connected to the Roman Empire. Now many argue that the king of the north is not the Antichrist, and that, that, and that the war described in Daniel 11.40 is between two kings, but this has problems as well, which could mean that the king described in verses 36 through 39 is not the subject of the action in verses 40 through 45. Now, this, is, this doesn't work either, because it's hard to believe that the angel would describe the king extensively in verses 36 through 39, and then suddenly drop him out of the picture and not mention him again in verses 40 through 45. So what I'm telling you is this. They say, some say, and it's ridiculous really when you think about it, the angels talks about this king who's going to deify himself and uh, be an absolute world military and political ruler in verses 36 through 39. Some say he's not mentioned in verses 40 through 45. What's the purpose of that? Why would the angel do that? That doesn't make any sense. It has no, it has no sense at all. So we see that the angel does describe this king in verses 36 through 39 because he's a major player in the events described in verses 40 through 45. The angel's not going to describe this king in detail in verses 36 through 39 and then not mention his ultimate destruction in verses 40 through 45. So again, what we have here is that in verse 40, at the, at the end time, the king of the south which we're going to say, that's Egypt, will collide, because Egypt has been that, and this is interesting, we'll come to our next interpretive issue. The king of the south, throughout chapter 11, has been what? Egypt. Then it says, we'll collide with him. Who? Well, in context, who we just get finished talking about? In verses 36 through 39, the Antichrist, who deifies himself, desecrates the temple, is an absolute world political and military leader, and religious leader. He wants to be worshipped by the whole world and no other rivals. So he's the him in verse 40. And it says the king of the north will storm against him with chariots. And as I'm going to show you, some people say the king of the north here is Russia and some like myself say it's Syria. And so therefore, who's right and who's wrong? Now, uh, this, that leads us to the second interpretive issue in verse 40 is the identity of of the king of the north. One of the most popular interpretations of the king of the north here in Daniel 11.40 is that this is a reference to Russia. Now, that's not supported by the context or history or the rest of the Bible. Now, listen to me. One of the, and many great men of God who I admire and learned a lot from uh, believe that. Now, what's interesting, I, this is something, brings up something I, I want to talk about a little bit is that a lot of people think it's Russia here, the king of the north. And one of the reasons why is the t current events. When a lot of these guys who were, uh, they lived through the Cold War, the 60s and the 50s, and the United States and Russia were going toe-to-toe, -to -toe, all right? So it's, I believe that it swayed their interpretation a little bit. So this is something I bring out. And all interpreters and you, the church, has to be wary of this. It's very tempting and when we look at current events, and you see this happen with people all the time, and they'll make predictions based upon current events and say, this is a fulfillment of this prophecy, and this is a fulfillment of that prophecy. We've got to be very careful of that, uh, especially you know, teaching from pulpits. You're teaching the body of Christ. You've know, you got to be very... We, we're, a lot of times, guys are very dogmatic of things that are nothing but speculation. We don't want to talk. If we're going to speculate, let's let our people know it's speculation. But don't, tell, don't say it's dogmatic. Yeah, this is it. When it's really speculation on your part based upon current events. So what I'm saying is because of the, the furor of the Cold War in America, many people were, were uh, I believe, influenced 
and identifying, interpreting the king of the north there in verses 40 through 45 as Russia. And uh, because they are north of Israel. However, they're extreme to the extreme north of Israel. They're actually mentioned in Ezekiel 38 and 39, which we studied in our Day of the Lord series. So, again, one of the most popular interpretations of the king of the north here in Daniel 11.40 is that it's a reference to Russia. Now, those who adhere to this interpretation, what they do is they connect also Daniel 11.40 to 45 to Ezekiel 38 and 39. Now, listen to me. I used to do this too. I believe that this was the case too. But once I've looked at this, I can't agree with that anymore. Now, you might say, geez, Pastor Bill, you changed. Well, would you rather me st not grow spiritually and grow as an interpreter, or would you want me to stay back in my knowledge base when I, was, when I first got saved or when I first uh, got ordained? I mean, your pastor should be growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ as well. So uh, well, I, I, I've since changed my view on it, and I haven't changed any fundamental doctrine of the Christian faith I believe in. I still believe in justification by faith, the deity of Christ, the Trinity. I mean, I believe in the confession of sin. So we're not talking about, I am, uh, we're talking about an interpretation here. All right? An interpretation that's not affecting any fundamental doctrine of the Christian faith. We just want to know what the, we want to be accurately in our interpretation. So there's a question here. This is, what, this is a situation I had to face is, okay, am I going to still stick to what I used to believe? Or am I going to change what I believe based upon what God showed me here? Because I've grown a little bit in my knowledge of the scriptures. I had to make the change. I can't, and that you'll see I've done. There are things I, uh, I can tell you over the years. Um, oh, let's, I'll give you an example, not to get sidetracked. But uh, I used to believe that, you know, uh, I used to believe as far as the impeccability issue of Christ, I believed that one time it was possible that Jesus could have sinned. You know, I, I don't believe that at all anymore. I studied this subject. There's no way he's God. He's the Son of God. So how could how could he have any possibility of sinning? And the people and I I know all the arguments about what and I I went through that and I I I said you know that's I can't agree with that anymore. That's just I can I can disprove I can debunk what I used to believe. So now what we see here is I what I used to believe. And a lot of great men of God. And this is not to knock them. I mean, it's just, I'm, we're trying to get to the truth here. I don't care. Uh, if I disagree with any great scholar, or it, it, and, and it, it, what the matter is, we want to know the truth. So what is it? So I used to believe that the Daniel eleven forty through forty five is connected to Ezekiel thirty eight and thirty nine because Ezekiel thirty eight and thirty nine, which we're going to note in a little bit, is speaking of an invasion of Israel from the north, but it's from the extreme north. All right. So Syria is north of Israel, and so is Russia. But Russia is well beyond Syria in the north of Israel. So those who adhere to this interpretation that Russia is the king of the north in verses 40 through 45 of Daniel chapter 11, they connect Daniel 11, 40 through 45 with Ezekiel 38 and 39. And they argue that these two passages describe a northern confederacy that will be composed of Russia and other Eastern European nations and will attack Antichrist during the last three and a half years of the 70th week. There are problems with this interpretation because if, as we're going to see in verses 38, chapter 38 and 39 of the book of Ezekiel, there's no inv invasion from is uh, Egypt mentioned. There's all these other nations that are mentioned in this invasion. And I'm going to point out what they are in Ezekiel 38, 39. But Egypt's not one of them. Now, you would think, with all those other nations mentioned in Ezekiel 38 and 39 that's coming with Russia to invade Israel in the 70th week, you'd think Egypt would be mentioned, right? But they're not. But they are mentioned, Egypt is, in Daniel 11, 40 through 45. So that's an alarm to say they couldn't be speaking of the same invasion. Because Egypt is a major, major nation. And end times prophecy, they would be mentioned along with these other nations in Ezekiel 38 and 39 as accompanying Russia to attack Israel, but they're not. So that's a red flag. So again, there are problems with the interpretation that Russia is the king of the north in Daniel 11, 40 through 45, because if you notice in Ezekiel 38 and 39, no invasion from Egypt is mentioned as is the case in Daniel 11, 40. Now also, the, the army invading Israel in Ezekiel 38 and 39 comes from the remotest, the text says, from the remotest parts of the north of Israel. Whereas in Daniel 11:40, 40, 
the Antichrist is said to be attacked by an army from the north with no mention as to how far, as is the case in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Now, as we noted, this is where we talk about uh, having discipline and interpreting. As we noted, the king of the north throughout Daniel chapter 11, verses 2 through 35, who has, we, who has been the king of the north? The Seleucid dynasty. The, the, the people who descended from Seleucus, one of Alexander's generals. They, the Seleucid Empire, was centrally located in Syria, which is, to, uh, which is now known today as Syria, north of Israel. And they, remember the Seleucid Empire got quite big at, some, at one point, and they encompassed nations around and to the north of Israel and east and west. But we see here... In chapter 11, who's been the king, of the, the, the king of the north? Syria. Who's been the king of the south? Egypt. Now, the same people who say that the king of the north in verses 2 through 35 is uh, Syria and that Egypt is the king of the south, they say, the same people say, verses 40 through 45, the king of the south is Egypt, but the king of the north is Russia now. How could that be? Why wouldn't it be Syria? So, as we noted, again, the king ruling the north throughout Daniel chapter 11 is referring to the Seleucid Empire, which was located to the immediate north of Israel, which was Syria as it is today. Now, why is it expositors consistently identify the king of the north in verses 5 through 35 as being a reference to Syria? But then when they get to verse 40, they interpret the king of the north as Russia. That's what we call inconsistent. And specifically, the, the expression is hermeneutically inconsistent, meaning hermeneutic speaking of the, the science and art of interpretation. It's inconsistent to, do, to interpret the king of the north as referring to Syria in verses 2 through 35, and then and when you get to verses 40 through 45, say it's now the king of, it's now Russia. It's, that's inconsistent, and it, you have no basis to make that determination only if you're going to interpret based upon Ezekiel 38 and 39 and say, ah, see, we know that's Russia in Ezekiel 38 and 39, so this must be Russia here in verse 40 through 45 as the king of the north. Not, that's not going to jive, as we're going to show you in a minute. So, in fact, many of these expositors who argue that the king of the north in Daniel 11:40 is Russia also say that the king of the south in Daniel 11:40 is Egypt. Why? Because Egypt has been fer referred to throughout chapter 11 as the king of the south. Now, why does this reasoning uh, not apply to the king of the north? You understand what I'm saying? The, the king of the south in two through, verses 2 through 35 is Egypt. Nobody's going to debate that. But when you get to verses 40 through 45, all of a sudden now, you know, they, they say, oh yeah, that's, it's Egypt. But when they go to the king of the north, though, why is the king of the north not still the Seleucid Empire, Syria, in verses 40 through 45. I mean, the, their reasoning for saying the king of the south is Egypt in verses 40 through 45 is that it's based upon the context. But they don't apply that when it comes to the king of the north. You follow me there? Let, let me see. Uh, she, okay, good. Because sometimes I don't know if you, you, you got that, and I don't want to beat a dead horse, but sometimes I do because I'm not sure that you, you know that. And if you, don't, if, you, if you have questions, please email me. Talk to me after, whatever. Just don't hug me. And I'm just kidding. You can hug me as much as you want. But I'm just saying that I, I want to make sure you understand the, the lo their logic. It's not right. Okay? And, and I want to make another th comment. Just because I'm disagreeing with these guys on an interpretation, that's not, I, I don't consider these guys my enemies. You've got to understand something. Expositors of the Bible, throughout, I, I stand on the shoulders of giants. I'm benefiting from the, the work of Pentecost and Theme and Wolvert and McGee and is Schaefer and Schofield and Darby and all these, and, and, and Luther and Calvin and Swingley, all these people, I stand on the shoulders of giants. I owe a lot to these guys. I wouldn't know anything except for these guys. All right? So I'm just, what I look at is commentators as sparring partners. You know, boxer, when he gets ready for a fight, he gets, he, you know, what is that, what's an is Ecclesiastes, iron sharpens iron. So it, it, what, this is what uh, a lot of, this is what scholars do they, they argue these things, and this is, you come to, you, it, uh, you come to okay, well, who's got the best argument or the, you know, the best interpretation of the passage? You know? And so when, I interp when we interpret, and I see a lot of guys not doing this, and 
is that we don't interpret in a vacuum, us pastors, and neither do you in the church. We're in a community. We are related to other Christians, the body of Christ. So to disregard what the church, the rest of the church has said throughout the centuries and up to today is wrong. Because these men had the Spirit of God, were led by the Spirit of God. So we should be listening to some of their interpretations in the ancient past as well. And they might have it right and we might have it wrong. So what is consistent, again, is to identify the king of the north as Syria, since this is how the king of the north was used throughout Daniel 11, 5 through 35. Therefore, the identity of the king of the north in Daniel 1140 should be determined in light of the Seleucid Empire. In other words, in light of the fact that throughout Daniel 11, 5 through 35, the king of the north is a reference to this empire, Syria, the Seleucid Empire, which was located to the immediate north of Israel, which today would be Syria. So let, let's go over. So uh, before we get, go to Ezekiel 38 now, I want you to hop over there. And we're going there for, for what reason? Because in Daniel 11, 40 through 45, some men say the king of the north is Russia. And they support that interpretation by going over to Ezekiel 38 and 39, which speaks of an invasion coming from nations to the extreme north of Israel. All right? So look at Daniel chapter 11, uh, excuse me, Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 1, please. Ezekiel 38, 1. Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 1. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speaking to Ezekiel, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I'm against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. Now, the name Gog is a title. It's a title like Caesar and Pharaoh. It's not a personal name. And it means the man on top, or in other words, the dictator. Now, the word Magog is interesting. It's, it's, Magog actually means the land of Gog. Now, Magog was the second son of Japheth, according to uh, Genesis 10.2. His descendants ex inhabited exclusively the region of the Caucasus and, and of northern Armenia. And it's, uh, and it's interesting, the name Caucasus... Uh, means Gog's fort. Josephus says that Magog was founded, uh, founded those that from him were named the Magogites, who by the, the Greeks were called Scythians. So up near Russia is where these people, what I'm saying, uh, they came from. So the Scythians, they had a tradition that their ancestors originally came from Armenia, and this agrees with the scriptures, which places the immediate descendants of Noah in Armenia. Historians agree that the Megagites were divided into two distinct races, the European races and the Asiatic, or in other words, the Japhetic and the Turanian. Uh, now, what's interesting, the descendants of Magog are the Russians, the Ukrainians, in the news, Hungarians, Finns, Siberians, Yugoslavians, Croatians, Bosnians, Serbians, Slovenians, uh, Slovakians, Bulgarians, Poles, and Czechs. So when he talks about Magog here, the descendants of Magog are all in, up in the Russian-Ukraine area, okay? And the Hungarians and the Finns and Siberians. So Ezekiel 38, verses 2 and 3, states that Gog, from the land of Magog, is the leader of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. Uh, the word Rosh there means first, head, or chief. Now it's interesting, Jacinius, who was a Hebrew lexographer in the 19th century, uh, he says the following about this word Rosh. He says, Rosh is the proper name of a northern nation, probably equated with the Russians. But this linguistic evidence is uncertain, presumptive. Therefore, we cannot base our interpretation here that Gog is the prince of Russia. But the geographical and contextual evidence is overwhelmingly in favor that Rosh was indeed located in Russia. And it's the, when it says north to the remotest parts of the north, as we're going to see in a minute, it says, and uh, was it in verse, uh, yeah, it's, uh, we'll show you in a second here, but hold on one sec, where is it, okay, so 
Rosh, Rosh here is, a, uh, is, is basically, what he's saying here is Russia here. Because it comes from the, the, the remotest parts of Israel in the north. So uh, Ezekiel 38, 6 and 15 and 39, 2 clearly state that these invading armies are coming from the extreme north. So look at verse, uh, let's read up to verse uh, 6. That's what I wanted to do. I should have done it first off. Look at Ezekiel chapter 38. And look at verse, where I want you to have it. Look at verse 4. I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, and all of them splendidly attire, a great, attired, a great company with buckler and shield, all of them wielding swords, Persia, Ethiopian, put with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer with all its troops, Beth Torgama, from the remotest, look what it says, from the remotest parts of the north with all its troops and many people. Uh, look at uh, verse 15. It says, you will come from your place out of the remotest parts of the north. It's telling us how far north of Israel that this army is coming from. So that's different when we see in Daniel 11, 40 through 45. It just says to the north. And throughout the chapter, north of Israel, the king of the north there has been Syria. And Syria is it's the immediate north of Israel, as it is today. Well, this is telling us that this invasion in Ezekiel 38 is coming from the remotest parts of the north of Israel. And if you look at the map, geography tells you that's Russia and the, and the Ukraine, all that area up there. So, verse 15, you will come from your place out of the remotest parts of the north, you and many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses, a great assembly and a mighty army. And uh, then it says, if you look at uh, Ezekiel 39... Verse 1, and you, son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, thus says the Lord God, behold, I'm against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and I will turn you around, drive you on, and take you up from the remotest parts of the north and bring you against the mountains of Israel. And by the way, God destroys this invasion supernaturally. No human army does the destroying. It's, Christ doesn't destroy it in his second advent. God does it. The Lord does it sometime during the 70th week. So, uh, if you, look at, uh, if you look at Ezekiel 38, 1 again. So how far north of Israel is key to interpreting whether the king of the north in Daniel 11, 40-45 is Russia or Syria? Well, Ezekiel 38, 39, that's definitely a, an invasion from Russia because say it's come from the remotest parts of the north. In fact, the text is saying, what, three times? Four times that this is the case, emphasizing to us, the reader, how far north of Israel this invasion is going to be originating. And it would be Russia. So, Ezekiel 38, 1, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. Uh, it's interesting... Um, we see here that the, uh, uh, the Meshach, would, uh, their descendants of Meshach here would be the Lithuanians, the Romanians. The descendants of Tubal today would be, we would know today as Georgia and Albania. Um, uh, some people think that Meshach uh, refers to the city of Moscow. I don't believe that. Um, but anyways, we see here that this is, this is all telling us, that if you look at verse 4 now, I'll, uh, this is all coming from the extreme, uh, this invasion is coming from the extreme north of Israel. So uh, verse 4 says, I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws. Like, why does he say that? God's saying you're like an animal to me, Russia, and all your satellites, all your allies. You guys are like wild animals. Again, here's like Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel, what, Daniel chapter 8. God's describing the Gentile nations as like beasts, wild beasts, because they're deceived by sin and Satan, driven by their sin nature. I will turn you about, verse 4, and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out, and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them splendidly attire, a great company with buckler and shield, all of them wielding swords, Persia, Ethiopia, and Put with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Goma with all its troops, Beth Togama from the remotest parts of the north with all its troops and many peoples with you. Interesting. Uh, Persia here is, is the, uh, the, we know, Persia today would be Iran. Ethiopia here would, uh, it's actually uh, referring to the Kushites, which is, would be, today would be Ethiopia and Sudan. We run into the, uh, them later on. Put would be modern Libya. 
And Gomer would be more, today known as modern Ukraine and Georgia, uh, which is ju uh, just directly south of Russia. Where we're having all the big deal over there now today. And Turgamar would be known as what today is called Tur Turkey. So Turkey is going to be involved in this invasion. So many people's would you would indicate the other groups of people that are related to, uh, to the ones mentioned already in verses 1 through Verses 1 through 6. So again, notice the remotest parts of the north. Well, how could, that doesn't jive with Daniel 11, 40 through 45. Daniel 11, 45, 40 through 45 says the king of the north is the king of the north and doesn't say how far he comes from the north. Now, also, verses 2 through 35 of Daniel chapter 11, the king of the north throughout the whole chapter has been what we know now today is Syria, the Seleucid Empire. So therefore, to be consistent, in our interpretation, if we're going to say Egypt in verses 2 through 35 of Daniel chapter 11 is Egypt, and we all agree, and we say, well, then, therefore, verses 40 through 45, the king of the south is still Egypt. Well, certainly, if we're going to be consistent, if verses 2 through 35 is the king of the north is Syria, the Seleucid Empire, which was located in Syria, what is not known as today as Syria, then verses 40 through 45, the king of the north has got to be, it's got to be Syria. And again, this is exciting because what you see going on today is not uh, in world events, current events, is not a fulfillment of prophecy, but this, a preparation for the fulfillment of the events prophesied about in the 70th week. So is it Egypt's going through tumultuous time right now? Syria is going through in a tumultuous time right now. Russia is rattling their swords right now. But... That doesn't mean nothing is being fulfilled right now in regards to the 70th week. We haven't started it yet. But God's working right now in current events like he always is. So we're, 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 it's very interesting. So I say you look at Bible prophecy helps you to look at inter uh, interpret, interpret, uh, interpret uh, current events in relation to the big picture what God's going to do on this earth and what he, you know, he's going to, that invasion we read in Ezekiel 38 and 39, God's going to destroy that without any human army. He's going to destroy them. He's going to blow them all. He's going to destroy them all with just his wrath from heaven using what we call natural disasters and sulfur and flame. What, well, what is it? We, we don't have time to do we do? We have time? Look at Ezekiel 39. We'll make time. Look at Ezekiel 39. Where I want to go here. Yo, uh, actually, look at Ezekiel chapter 38. Look at verse 18. And it will come about on that day. This is going to be the destruction of Russia and our allies during the 70th week when they attack Israel. And it, by the way, it's a time of peace uh, when this takes place. If you read the whole ch ch chapters 38 and 39, Israel's at peace, unwalled cities. Uh, but you read Daniel 11, 40 through 45, Israel's at war. So it says in verse 18, it will come about on that day when God comes against the land of Israel, declares the Lord God that my fury will mount up in my anger, in my zeal and in my blazing wrath. I declare on that day that there'll be, there sh will surely be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. The fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all the creeping things that creep on the earth, and all the men who are on the face of the earth will shake at my presence. The mountains also will be thrown down. The steep uh, pathways will collapse, and every wall will fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against him on my, on my mountains, declares the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother. So they'll destroy themselves with friendly fire, we call it. With pestilence and with blood, I will enter into judgment with him, and I will reign on him, this is the dictator of Russia, and on his troops and on the many peoples who are with him, a torrential rain with hailstones, fire, and brimstone. And why is God going to do this? To glorify himself. I will magnify myself, sanctify myself, and make myself known in the sight of many nations, and they will know that I am the Lord God. Goes on to talk more about this destruction of the Russian army, the massive Russian army uh, by God. That's the future for Russia. And the future for Syria and Egypt 
is they're going to go to war against the Antichrist. So I want to close here with one other thing which will develop in subsequent evenings. But go back to Daniel 11.40, please. So in my translation of Daniel 11.40, now during the end time, the king ruling the south, Egypt, will cause himself to go to war against him, the Antichrist, the absolute world dictator who will deify himself that's described in verses 36 and 30 through 39. Also the king ruling the north, Syria and her allies, will cause himself to storm against him, the Antichrist, with a military chariot group, with a cavalry, as well as a large armada of ships. Now, there's one other question I want to talk about, get, uh, mention briefly before we close. We, there's another question we must ask regarding these prophetic, two, first two prophetic statements in verse 40. Namely, where will the Antichrist and his armies be located when this attack is launched against him? Will he be in Europe? Will he be in Israel? Where will he be? Will he be in Israel or will he be located in Rome or somewhere else in Europe? The prophetic statements in verses 40 through 45 would indicate that the Antichrist will be in Israel when Egypt and Syria and their allies attack him. And then this is going to lead to other questions that we're going to note tomorrow and, the, and Thursday is why are they going to attack him? Well, we'll see. They're going to attack him because Antichrist is going to deify himself. He's going to say, you worship me. What do you think their, their response is going to be predictable? Well, I'm going to go fight you. The other reason why they're not going to like him is because he's, he's in the Middle East. They don't want that there. I mean, look at the United States today. The Middle East, people in nations in the Middle East don't want us in the Middle East. They don't want the NATO over there. They don't want the United States over in the Middle East. Well, the Antichrist is basically, it won't be America. It'll be, if America is involved, they're not a big player anymore. And we see that the Antichrist is going to go and occupy, he's going to go into, in, 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 in response to the agreement that he made with the leadership of Israel, he will already be in the Holy Land when he gets attacked by Egypt and Syria. So, the other, but the question I want to mention here this evening, I don't want to talk about that in detail tonight. The question is, where will the Antichrist and his armies be located when this attack described in verses 40 through 40, 45 is launched against him? Will he be in Israel, or will he be located in Rome or somewhere else in Europe? Now, the prophetic statements, as I said before, in these verses, in this paragraph, in verses 40 through 45, indicate the, the Antichrist will be in Israel when Egypt and Syria and their allies attack him. This is indicated by two major factors. One, the first is obvious, is that Egypt is located to the immediate south of Israel and Syria to the immediate north. The other thing is, and, oh, before I get there, though it is possible, it's highly unlikely that these two nations would attack the Antichrist and his revived form of the Roman Empire in Europe. They're in the Middle East. They're not going to go pack it up and go launch an attack against the United States of Europe, the final stage of the Roman Empire, while the Antichrist is in Europe. They're going to launch the attack, more likely, while he's in the Middle East. It's logistically reasonable. Whereas in being attacking him while he's in Europe is logistically crazy to do for them. So it's more likely they attack him while he's occupying Israel because this occupation would give these two na nations a sound motive to attack him. Uh, the second major factor indicating that Egypt and Syria will attack Antichrist while he's occupying Israel is that Daniel 11.41, if you notice, says that he will enter the beautiful land which is, is Israel. And then in verse 42, it says he exercises his military might against Egypt. And then in verse 43, it says that he will gain control of Egypt economically. So therefore, it would appear that Egypt and Syria will attack the Antichrist while he's occupying Israel, since chronologically, in the passage, Egypt is defeated by him after he enters Israel. Interestingly, Verse 44 says that rumors from the east and the north will disturb him. The rumors from the north are Syria and her allies because we've already determined from the context of chapter 11 that the king of the north is a reference to Syria and not a reference to the northern king who attacks Israel as prophesied in Ezekiel 
chapters 38 and 39. The army from the east is more than likely the same army mentioned in Revelation 16, which comes from the dried up Euphrates, comes over the dried up Euphrates River to attack the Antichrist. This army from the east, and we'll study it when we get to verse 44, we'll look at it in detail. This army from the east is a reference to the kings from the east and Daniel, uh, Revelation 16, 12, who crossed the Euphrates, which God will dry up so that they can come across. So the, uh, the phrase, the kings of the east, is a poetical expression in Revelation 16, 12. Uh, it refers to the kings where the sun rises in the east. That would be China, Japan, India, Persia, and Afghanistan. Not just Russia. Afghanistan, Persia could be involved, India, Japan, so it, Korea you could throw in there too. Vietnam. So therefore, it appears that the first two prophetic statements in verse 40, that the kings of the north and the south will attack the Antichrist, is a summary statement, which is developed later on in verses 41 through 45. Thus, when the angel says in Daniel eleven forty four that rumors from the north will disturb the Antichrist, he's referring back to his statements in verse 40, that the king of the north, who is Syria, will attack him. And let me tell you another thing. If you notice in the chapter, only Egypt is said to be defeated by the Antichrist. Syria appears to fight with the Antichrist up to the second advent of Christ. Because they're not mentioned as being defeated like Egypt is. So it doesn't mention it, so we can't put words in the, We can't say, oh yeah, they're defeated by the Antichrist. It doesn't say that the Antichrist defeats them. Which would imply that they're fighting with him all the way to the second advent of Christ like China you know, from the East and Korea and all these nations, Afghanistan, uh, they're going to be uh, waging war with the Antichrist right up to the second advent of Jesus Christ. And of course, Israel is in the middle of the whole thing, and they got a bunch of freedom fighters that are fighting in this city. If you read Zechariah, uh, this small remnant is survived, and they fight it out with the Antichrist. It's funny, the Antichrist can't take, remember it says in Zechariah, he doesn't take over the whole city of Jerusalem. He can't, he, he's got a, a small army of Jewish fighters that are staving him off from having total control of the city, which is, again, supernatural if you read the book of Zechariah. God gives him that power to withstand the Antichrist this, uh, and hold off half the city of Jerusalem during the tribulation period. Well, I want to just wrap up with this and then get out of here. What, is this all, what, what should all this, again, do for us? Again, should motivate us to pray for our unsaved pe friends and family members. We don't want them to go through the wrath, of God, wrath to come, which we're reading about. The church is delivered from the wrath to come. 1 Thessalonians 1.10. 1 uh, Thessalonians 5.9. We're not mentioned in the tribulation in Revelation uh, 6 through 19 because we're in heaven with the Lord. We, in fact, Revelation 19, 1 through 7 says that while that tribulation's going on, we've, be, we've already been married to the Lord. And we come back with Christ to end the tribulation period. So it also, it should motivate us to live godly lives because what do we learn in the book of Titus? We evangelize not simply by our words, but by our godly conduct. We need to stand out from the rest of the world that's deceived by sin and Satan. We are to be lights in the world. So our godly character, not just our godly words and communicating the gospel accurately, but our godly character in conjunction with our words is what's going to lead people to the to Savior. So when this prophecy motivates us to live godly lives, and in light of the imminence of uh, uh, occurrence of these events that prophesied in the scriptures. So it also is giving us, God's giving us a view to what's going to happen in the future. He's letting us in on these things. He's treating us as his friends. And so if your friend tells you something uh, that he wants you to know and confides in you, it would be rude of you and I to say to our friend who's confiding in us and, say, and, and disregard what they have to say and not pay attention. So therefore, let's not insult God and just say, oh, who cares about this? I'm not going to be around for this. Well, that's wrong. God wants you to know this thing because he's treating you as a friend here. Jesus wants you to know what's going to happen here or what's the current events to motivate us to evangelize, to live a godly life. God, we're getting God's perspective of history. What he is doing in current events today is, uh, is understood by the prophetic events that we're reading about in the book of Daniel, and Revelation, and Ezekiel, and, and whatnot. So let's uh, close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit would encourage us, instruct us, and challenge us, and rebuke us, and reprove us. And we praise you and thank you 
for delivering us from this terrible wrath to come. Help us uh, use these things that we've learned uh, in in the book of Daniel to motivate us to live a a, a godly life, to exemplify holiness, to exemplify Christ-like character, and to, when opportunity given, to communicate the gospel to our non-Christian family members and friends and people we work with and go to school with and whatnot. We just uh, thank you so much, Father, for letting us see these things about what's going to happen on this earth in the future. And we thank you and praise you, and we pray that your will be done uh, on earth as it is in heaven. In our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.